Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and everyone out there, thank you for tuning in. Today on the program, we have a great show planned for you where, hey, in the second part of the show, if we have any time allotted, we will be doing computer and technology news where, hey, we'll, we will be covering as much as we can with relevant tech, uh, everything fresh, everything new, and, uh, hey, things that you want to hear about. And in the meantime, though, in the first part of the show, as we usually do, we have a guest, um, and that will be entirely dedicated to our guest. And if you haven't heard of My Smart Privacy, which is really a website and really a collection of articles by our guest, Mr. Rex Lee, he will be joining us to talk all about um, you know security, malware, uh, you know, and everything goes that goes into it from the legal side, and just. You know, this is a topic that we give so much uh, airtime to, and yet we never seem to cover it all. And even when we do, trust me, every single week there are large institutions, individuals, and everything in between that are, are unfortunately compromised. So this is going to be a very informative show. I'm looking forward to it. But before we get started, ComputerAmerica.com. That's where you'll find everything, including a link to our guest website. Uh, once again, My Smart Privacy. But all you have to remember is ComputerAmerica.com. We'll have a link in the show notes after the program and it, it will include anything that we talk about any articles any material uh don't worry just sit back relax and uh, yeah you can find it later uh also be sure to check out some of our recent articles uh, that we have there, we publish reviews, we pro, you know we publish op eds, uh, all of our newspaper articles that we write and columns that we write. Uh, we make sure that you can find them on Computer America. Find us on social media, uh, wherever podcasts are heard as well after the radio program. And hey, that's uh, that's our long winded intro. So everyone, let's uh, let's go ahead and get um, you know just get comfortable and join in with our guest, who again, Black Ops partners and really you know my smart privacy but he's here really as an expert and i'm sure that he can speak on any number of topics and i think this is going to be a very interesting conversation as i said before mr rex m lee and uh yeah he's the cybersecurity and privacy advisor once again for black ops partners so rex welcome on to computer america how you doing good thank you for having me on Perfect. Coming in loud and clear. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, as I said before, cybersecurity is a topic that really we we do dedicate tons of time to it. Uh, you know, we have a regular correspondent that does cybersecurity, but even e even with us banging and beating this drum for, you know, I've been here for about seven years and before that Craig Crossman uh, was doing this for 25 years talking about cybersecurity. Uh, it doesn't really seem to make a dent. So uh, before we get into the state of the industry, let's talk about um, you know my smart privacy, Black Ops Partners, the organizations that you're associated with, and talk about your background. Where you know where did you come from, and how long have you been doing cybersecurity? Well, I have a, a tech and telecom background. I've been in tech and telecom since uh, 1983. 
I was, uh, I started in the wireless communication industry. Uh, I, I quit going to school about two years into my uh, college career to sell pagers. And my <laughs> parents said, there's no future in them beepers. And I'll never forget that because uh, uh, that was the beginning of what we know as the wireless communication industry and that, that my paging career led into cellular. Um, and then um, uh, in the early 2000s, I got into uh, platform and application development, uh, interfacing um, platforms such as Remedy, Help Desk, uh, SAP and Siebel platforms with uh, wireless uh, networks. Um, so I started off in... Uh, in paging and cellular, and then uh, got more into platform and app or, uh, application development uh, later on in my career. Um, I um, launched an application and platform company called Houdini Soft, uh, which was a uh, algorithm that uh, we wrote that would unlock over 600 makes and models of smartphones and uh, cellular phones. So it was the antithesis of, uh, of security. Uh, the application was used by um, many carriers such as Metro PCS and Cricket. And what it did is it enabled uh, people to come into those locations with their phones from Verizon and other carriers and um, unlock and reprovision the phones on their network. Or if you want to go by the street terms, jailbreaking and yeah. flashing. So <laughs> we, we developed a... Uh, a jailbreaking and flashing uh, application on steroids. Uh, we always joke that we had one foot uh, on the business highway and one in federal prison with that application. Uh, we were challenged by Virgin Mobile, yeah. who sued uh, Metro PCS over it, and our we had to uh, divulge our IP in uh, court to make sure we weren't breaking or violating any laws associated with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Turned out we, we weren't. And uh, we also helped uh, write uh, technical arguments against Apple, AT&T, and other companies. And CTIA, the governing body of wireless, uh, they came after us big time because they didn't want uh, uh, consumers to be able to unlock their phones and, and move them to any carrier. I was about to say to. that that um, you know the the technology that you're talking about there and, and really uh, the the ability to jailbreak phones if it like at one point if it wasn't um, illegal the the cell phone carriers and cell phone makers of course um, they have since lobbied and pushed to make it illegal so you know even even if you were like you said you know you you uh, you completely complied with the courts you were completely in the legal. Over time, I'm sure that they would have straight up made it illegal what you were doing. Well, actually, they uh, they tried to in uh, 2009. Uh, the the Digital Millennium Copyright Act uh, it gets updated every three years. So in 2009, um, Apple, AT and T, and other wireless uh, carriers and technology providers start writing arguments against uh, uh, allowing the consumers to unlock their phones or circumvent it with a digital cable. I don't want to get too technical here. Oh, please do. Yeah. But uh, basically to unlock their phones and uh, uh, do with their phones what they would like and or laptop PCs or any other app-driven technology. Uh, so uh, the EFF, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the same people that uh, supported uh, Edward Snowden uh, mm -hmm. had contacted us uh, and said, we're getting arguments uh, against allowing consumers to unlock their phones can you help us out with these technical arguments so our our handset uh, our director of uh, handset uh, development mike dawson started writing uh, technical arguments with our lawyers for the eff and then uh long story short the 2009 ru ruling came down from the library of congress and uh, uh un unlocking and uh, flashing phones was uh, upheld um, and our arguments were upheld over Apple, AT&T, and other, other uh, technology providers. Uh, so we, we preserved the right for um, uh, consumers to be able to unlock their, their technology. All but, all but 25 words of the new law were our arguments. So all this led into cybersecurity, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, with the evolution of LTE, uh, manufacturer locks were no longer an issue with uh, smartphones because that was mainly predominantly associated with CDMA phones uh, that were locked by the manufacturers. So when uh, LTE started to proliferate, uh, the need to, uh, you know, those those locks could be bypassed with a code 
rather than an algorithm. <laughs> there, so. there's, there's certainly a, a lot to unpack there, and of course, yeah. some of it is, is, you know, kind of recent history. I would say ancient history, uh, even though technology seems to move so fast. Uh, yes. and, and really, a lot of what you're talking about there is something that, uh, you know, just to bring it into something that continues to make headlines, and that is the the right to repair movement. I just found an article a day or two ago about uh, the U.S. military is having problems with, uh, you know, companies that get these government contracts, and they put digital rights management on uh, mm -hmm. military equipment. And the military is not allowed to fix their own equipment. They just have to either trash it or they have to pay very large sums for these private companies to fix it because of digital rights management. And, you know, this relates to smartphones and the right to repair. Uh, this is still a huge issue. I, I mean, do you see that going away or do you see what you've been working on for, you know, a decade just continue to evolve and stick around? Uh, it, I, I don't see it going away. The if you if you notice, you know, when I look, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an old computer nerd. I'm <laughs> I uh, in college I was uh, my first uh, courses were Fortran, if you can imagine. And uh, <laughs> so punch, punch cards are going to come back. Don't yeah. worry. <laughs> so uh, need I cobalt? You know, need I say more? Uh, but my first computer was a Tandy with a cassette deck. Okay, the cassette deck was the uh, hard drive in that uh, computer. Um, so, um, uh, so in coming up, uh, you know, when I came up, we were able to, um, uh, program our own computers. We, uh, we were able to control what software was put onto our hard drives. Um, in the nineties, we started buying computers with bloatware that was put onto the, the, the computers and all this is relevant to our discussion. It, it actually is. Uh, so in the nineties, we were, we were buying computers with bloatware, but we could go in and, and remove that bloatware. Mm -hmm. Well, tech providers, uh, mainly Apple, um, uh, was on to this. So when the when the first connected iPods uh, started uh, uh, proliferating, people could no longer get in and control the apps. So the apps were uh, put onto the device, and, and the pre-installed apps you could no no longer um, uh, uninstall. Uh, and this be, became the model for the Android OS uh, as well. This was the early version of the Apple iOS. So um, you, you can no longer remove those apps. And, and that, that in lies of, of the issues with a lot of the cybersecurity um, uh, issues that I'm going to bring up today are, are associated with uh, pre-installed apps um, and, and so forth. But uh, getting back to, you know, the right to repair, it's the same model. You know, if you notice that uh, a lot of technology, you, you have no longer, you have no control over the battery because the devices are glued. Yeah. Uh, you can't just pop it open and change the battery. Well, it's the same thing. Everything in there, if you look at the components, you want to get real technical about it. All the components are glued together. So if you tried to get in there and fix it yourself, you can't do it anyways. Uh, and that's by design. You know, they want, they do not want you in, in that technology. They don't want you to control it. They don't even want you to control the power source of the technology because a lot of the pre-installed apps on this technology actually keep the device from sleeping. So if you power your device down, it's actually never really 100% so, powered down. Yeah, I, I, and of course, you know, things like Find My iPhone and, and whatnot, they, uh, you know, they use uh, that kind of lower level operating system to send data. But my question to you relates to, uh, you know, th this idea of, you know, these apps that you can't uninstall and things like that. And of course, the battery that you can't repair without a certified technician, quote unquote, that uh, the companies that, you know, even after Apple said, all right, fine, third party repair places are okay, but they have to be trained by us and certified by us and so even though they kind of lost the legal fight they still control the market because they're the ones who hand out the parts the certificates the training so on and so forth yeah. so here's my question to you and this is this is the argument that these tech companies put up is that um and and really i'm, I'm thinking of things like john deere where mm -hmm. you can buy a two hundred fifty thousand five hundred thousand dollar combine but you're buying the equipment but then you are simply renting or leasing the the software, the firmware, the updates, the operating system. You and and that's their argument for you know not allowing people into and deleting certain things is that you know you buy the hardware, but we still own the software that it's running on, and I think that is a a huge source of contention 
what is your response to that? Where, you know, just like you mentioned back in the 90s, uh, they could ship bloatware all they want, but you had complete control over the software after that fact. That's that's not what companies are arguing nowadays. Well, exactly. You know, so the the best terminology for this, if, if you really want to go back to the roots of this, where did this all start? Mm -hmm. Well, it started with free software and it started with free uh, uh, services such as really, if you want to look at the the genesis of this, it was that free Google browser that you got in the 90s and you thought it was the coolest thing ever. And then you didn't realize that the business model behind that web browser was a business model called surveillance capitalism. Well, surveillance capitalism is the, the, the root cause to all of this. Uh, with, what that basically means is that the user is monetized. So you give away something free and then you monetize the use of that. Uh, and that's paid for with your privacy and your cybersecurity these days and much more. So you have to look at the, where, where did all that start? Well, if you give something away, well, if you want to get somebody's personal information, which is the most valuable information, uh, which is the most valuable commodity on the planet today, um, which is really, I term it as personal and professional information or your digital DNA. If you want to get somebody's digital DNA, give them away something free and collect their use <laughs> on it, package that, you can aggregate it. And you can also uh, store it in cloud computers and, and sell it as a commodity. So that's that's where all of that really began. So before it was more of a voluntary thing, I would go on and I would have to download the Google browser. Well, mm -hmm. they figured out as, again, it, the roots of this stuff being pre-installed, uh, where I first saw it was with Apple products. So now that becomes an app that's pre-installed into the device and I can, I, I have no no choice but to uh, uh, buy the product and use those apps. Well, those apps then are also uh, supported by uh, surveillance and data mining business practices that are rooted in surveillance capitalism. And then those apps will uh, collect all your user data off of those devices. And then uh, the companies then collect that and use that uh, for financial gain, really at the expense of your privacy. There, there was a company, and you might recall which one it was. Uh, I want to say it's Lenovo, and I know it's you know kind of risky to pinpoint a particular manufacturer like that, but I think Lenovo took it to the point where they were shipping computers with uh, ma well, not malware, well, bloatware that acted as malware. Where, much to your point, if it comes pre-installed on a computer, they found that they were actually sending your data, your analytics, your you know your your usage habits back to third party servers that you never that you agreed to by owning the computer like you never really agreed to it but by owning the computer you agreed to the pre-installed uh essentially malware that was on there um is that kind of the end result it's just where if you can get it on the computer when people buy it uh you're a fair game because and you know to kind of add a little bit more to this and i'm sure you've heard about the european um, uh, not any user license agreement. The the European Data Protection uh, mm -hmm. legislation that's been working its way through and is now passed. Um, this idea of who owns data. You know, if you collect it, you own it. Versus it's you know it's data about Ben. So Ben should own the data regardless of who's storing it. Um, yeah, it it seems so convoluted that uh, you know it's the collectors versus the collectees. Um, right. It's messy. It's messy. So this brings up, let's, let's, so if you want to go back to my website, uh, um, I was contacted by the Epic Times out of New York, and they asked me to write a series of articles based on um, uh, research that I did on a, a Samsung Galaxy Note smartphone. So how all this research that I did on the uh, phone and the pre-installed app started, it was I was doing, a, uh, I was contracted by Space Data out of uh, Chandler, Arizona to uh, uh, do some work for them. They're a defense contractor and they build high altitude communication platforms for the military. Mm -hmm. So they had a BYOD program and uh, they allowed uh, contractors and employees to use their own devices with very little security other than an MDM app. And I'll, I won't get too deep in the weeds about how really unsecure those things are <laughs> to begin with, but uh, I, I I, the CEO, Jerry Knobloch, um, uh, ended up in competition with Google. And this is all relevant to all of this. So 
he came in complaining one day, hey, uh, you know, Google started the Google Loon program and we're in competition with Google. And I had noticed that they were uh, utilizing, um, um, his company had a BYOD program, so half his employees were utilizing uh, uh, Google products that were supported by the Android OS, meaning that his employees were bleeding in corporate information by the use of those products to their very business competitor, Google, much like the Lenovo computers were collecting data and sending that off to third parties. So um, uh, I explained that to Jerry and he was like, oh my God, you know, let's prove this out. So I, I basically reverse engineered a, a Samsung Galaxy Note mm -hmm. smartphone from an application standpoint, more so than a coding standpoint, to see how much information each of the pre-installed apps, the apps I couldn't, uh, I couldn't uninstall. If you download something to your, your, your uh, smartphone or your uh, tablet PC, that's up to you. You know, that's on you. Mm -hmm. But when I buy something, I'm forced to use what's already on there. So I wanted to go in there and uh, identify exactly how much information the apps were collecting and who was collecting it. It took me four months to um, uh, analyze all the apps and then um, uh, identify the companies that were uh, collecting the information um, by way of the apps. I identified over 18 companies, including a company, a nation state company from China called Badu, that was enabled to collect nearly 100% of the information that uh, was associated with the use of that device. Uh, Badu is a, a partner of Google. It was nothing nefarious. It wasn't anything like finding Chinese surveillance technology hidden in the device. It's, it's out there up front, and this is all done through partnerships with Google. So the other issue that I found out was the apps were uh, programmed to uh, uh, commandeer all of the sensors on the device, including hardware such as the camera and microphone. So a lot of people think that only Facebook or Google may have control of their camera or microphone. That's mm -hmm. not true. It's multiple companies and it's simultaneously. So, so depending on the amount of pre-installed apps that come on a device or the, the number of apps a person downloads, there could be as many as 30 plus multinational companies, including nation state companies from Russia and China that have control of your camera and your microphone, plus are, um, have apps that are uh, programmed to collect your contacts, your email, um, um, and other um, uh, user data, including your account data. So let's go back to malware. I wrote a, you know, what is malware? Malware is simply a, it's simply a computer program that's designed to collect information uh, from the use of a technical product, to, to put it in layman terms. Uh, well, I wrote an article called Legal Malware, How Tech Companies Collect Your Personal and Professional Information Through Apps. Well, at, an app itself is nothing more than a, a piece of legal malware. When you look at the app permissions and how much information you're giving up by the use of that app, and how much information that app is taking you, it's taking as much or more information from the user than somebody who would create malware to, to collect information on a user. So it's, a, it's amazing when you look at the total amount of information that's being collected by these apps. It, it is, and at the same time, the apps, like, I don't know if they seem so uh innocent not innocent but um you know there's there's like a low threshold for danger with certain apps when you know uh i uh, just we had a guest on the show and i had to kind of press them on this one they have a and I actually have the device oh, uh, there, we go. there we go uh it's actually um uh, they have a light right here loom cube they uh you know, oh they uh the battery is dead but anyways it's a light and they have a smartphone app that lets you control it so that it can work as like a flash or something like that when you take pictures with your smartphone camera and they ask for permission for the microphone as well and i'm like does your light uh you know is it voice activated you know can you say turn on the light or something like that uh and they said no and i'm like why are you asking for the microphone and they said well you know we can and we might do something with it in the future so we're just going to ask for permission now and that that seemed like kind of par for the course and you may correct me but right. you know these companies and and i'm gonna go you know facebook as well but software companies uh companies with apps they they see the permissions that they're allowed to ask for and they just go you know why the heck not and they ask for all the permissions even if they don't need them right right uh 
the the problem is is um, there there's two ways you're granting permission. One way is a way that you're that's transparent to you. When I download a third party app, all the permissions are become transparent to me through the uh, the process of downloading. Now you're you, you're a pretty experienced technology user, aren't you? No, uh, I try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me ask you this question. How many times do permissions come up asking you for access to your microphone and camera and other data with a pre-installed app that came on your your um, on your devices? Uh, so uh, to my <laughs> to, to, to my knowledge, only a few will do that where and mainly I have it and like I have to go into my settings, especially for um, especially for um, and, and and by the way, we might have to reconnect here in a moment uh, because of something that happened. But I, I will say that uh, for right now, in my settings, I have to make applications ask me for permission to use my location settings and things like that. Like that's something I had to do. Um, if I hadn't set those, never. I mean, they would just all assume that I gave permission to everything anyway. Now, you're talking about using the use of uh, Android or Apple? Apple, 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 Apple. Yep. Maybe. Exactly. So the Apple has it halfway right, but not. It's not a hundred percent secure. Right. Uh, in that manner, because I, uh, I, I've leveraged two uh, carriers into admitting that smartphones, tablet PCs, connected products supported by the Android OS, Apple iOS, and Microsoft Windows OS are not secure forms of telecommunications or mobile computing due to pre-installed. Um, surveillance and data mining technology created by the operating system developers, which is uh, Google, Apple, and Microsoft, plus their trusted partners, which are the pre-installed app developers that pay them billions of dollars to mm. gain access to you, uh, which include companies such as Facebook, Amazon, and even Badu, uh, which I had found on the uh, Samsung Galaxy Note. That's how the game is. The game works this way. The, the three operating system uh, developers are the gateway. They own access to the user because their operating system is on all our tech these days. So the companies that pay them billions of dollars to gain access to you are companies such as Amazon, um, uh, Facebook, Badu, Tencent, which is the uh, developer of the WeChat app, which is the, one of the most popular apps in the world. But if you're over 25, you don't know what WeChat is. If you're under 25, you don't use <laughs> WhatsApp anymore. You use WeChat. Uh, if you're um, over 25, you don't know who TikTok is. But if you're under 25, uh, TikTok is the uh, social media app that people are using these days over Facebook and other apps. And that's created by ByteDance. Uh, and that's a nation state company from China. Well, all of those companies collectively want access to the operating system user. So when you get down to it, it's not the app user that's really for sale. Uh, it's the operating system user that's for sale. So Google, Apple, Microsoft put their operating system users up for sale to these companies, either through pre-installed apps or apps that are developed and uh, distributed through uh, the Apple App Store, the Google Play, or Microsoft App Store. So that's how the game is played. So these apps are really legal malware, and so are these platforms, and they, they grant them access to collect your information because these companies make money off of the information that they collect from you, which is which it all goes back to a circle what we were talking about earlier. The root problem to this is surveillance capitalism. Now, if you go back to the articles that I wrote for the Epic Times, it's a whole series of articles. It starts with the first article, um, that uh, explains what surveillance capitalism is and how, how the user is monetized. Then it goes into legal malware. So getting back to the Samsung Galaxy Note smartphone, when I identified the 18 companies that were enabled to surveil and data mine all of my information, I wanted to know what, how was this legal? Did I, actually, did I actually allow all these companies to gain access towards me when I bought the phone? So I went into the terms of use. So aside from uh, analyzing the apps, all this took me to, to, to uh, uh, reverse engineer how all of the apps work, to understand who was collecting the information, and was it legal, um, um, and, and to review all of the, uh, all of the uh, um, uh, terms of use associated with it. It took me four months. So basically, it took me four months to read my cellular phone contract that was associated with it. It, it turned out that I, uh, when I added up all of the legalese from mm -hmm. the 18 companies that manufactured the pre-installed apps and content, 
plus the app permissions and uh, the privacy policies and the end user licensing agreement. When I read all of that, it was over 3,000 pages of legalese uh, that was connected. When I first activated the device and clicked on I agree, I was agreeing to all of those companies' terms of use. So you have to look at it individually. You're agreeing to each individual company's terms of use, which is a whole set of privacy policies, uh, end user licensing agreements and terms and conditions. But what's unbeknown to you is hidden legal leaves within the device. So I can go online and look at Google or Apple or, or Amazon's privacy policies. I can go online and look at their terms of use and I can go online and look at their end user licensing agreements. What's hidden from you are the pre-installed application permission statements that tell the user exactly how much information they're giving up to Google, Apple, or any of these other app and platform developers, uh, plus the um, uh, access to the um, yeah the no, access the the the, the, the that, access to and then plus plus yeah. the access to the um, um, sensors and hardware. Yeah, so it, that, it's, that's what that's what they hide from you. They hide from they they put online. Hey, we're going to collect your information. We're not going to identify you, or so they say. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to sell that to third parties. But then they hide in the device that they can access your camera and microphone without your consent. That they collect your text messages, your contacts, your calendar information, your location data. They gain access to your accelerometer. They know when you're sitting, walking, yeah. sitting, moving. They even track your driving habits. They'll even have their app permissions that say that they can monitor your car's speed. It's not by connecting with the car. It's through the accelerometer on the device and so forth. So, so. There, there, there's three different things I was about to write them down, and I'm just going to say them out loud and hope that I, that I remember them. Uh, the first thing that, uh, you know, and we're going to talk about each of these in turn, but the first one um, is going to be about depersonalizing data, how uh, these big tech companies say that they strip all of your user data of personally identifiable information. Although right. I'm sure, as you know, that's uh, that doesn't work all too well. So that's point one. I want to get all three out here, and then we'll, um, you know, take it as you see fit. Uh, the second one was an article that was just published like two days ago about Mozilla removing 200 add-ons from the Firefox store, and yep. that was and and to your point with reading all of these documents and man, uh, it really speaks to your constitution that you're able to go through those. So that's uh, it's quite amazing. But one of the reasons. <laughs> Yeah. My corporate attorney said I was probably the only person on earth who read the user. Well, yeah, they uh, and, and and but that's the irony of it is that we all agree to them, but none of us read it. And um, you know, th there have been like contests where people have won money by reading it and things like that. Um, and but I do want to say that uh, the reason I bring up the Mozilla case was that they took down like 129 from one one particular company, but they found. I think it was like 60 or 70 or 80 of them were they had conflicting end user license agreements that they yep. would you know copy and paste from different parts and they would actually contradict one another and sometimes yes, it, I, uh, yeah i'd love to share my screen because i just pulled that up i knew i kind of felt where you were going with i this, so i got mind. the article from tech radar so i don't know which website that you're pulling yours from but um, oh no i'll show you from my own research Oh, oh yeah, sure. Please, uh, please go ahead and share it, and we'll uh, be able to throw it up on the video portion here. Uh, okay. If I uh, can, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I have three points. That was the first one. Uh, I'm sorry, that was the second one. The first one was depersonalizing, per, depersonalizing the data, and I already forgot the third one. But um, I gotta say that um, yeah, th this is a part of data um, sharing that. Like I said, they just kind of take all, oh, no, 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 no. I remember the, the, the third point. The third point, uh, and we can talk about this later, but the third point is back in the day in the wild, wild west of, you know, um, kind of the internet and data collection and things like that. Like uh, we had the NSA collecting metadata of all phone calls happening in the United States for national security reasons, or so they say. Um, right. and they had like, you know, petabytes or terabytes or exabytes of data, whatever it was every single day, they built huge data farms out in the middle of nowhere to host all the data. And to me, it seemed like the protection for the individual, uh, uh you know, to protect them was that we, we, and I mean the government, the government couldn't 
ac and government and private industry couldn't use all the data that they were collecting. They were collecting so much data, it was just a giant, massive pile to go through, and they were using it very ineffectively. With recent advances in artificial intelligence, and I know that's just a fancy term for machine learning and you know just trying things over and over right. again, um, through recent advancements, now we're starting to get to the point where even massive piles of data are starting to become usable. And that's where a lot of problems are coming up recently. So, uh, yes, exactly. Um, I, I'm, I would like to share this example real quickly. <sighs> Unfortunately, I'm not seeing your screen. So that's kind of part of the problem. Let's see. Yeah. I, uh, for some reason that, uh, should be right I, there I in new I, share and hopefully I can see you, but I, I, I can't, uh, maybe because I'm sharing my screen with you. So let me try to stop sharing and then you can probably share with me. So no, I, it, it reformatted, which is really weird. And it doesn't have that as an option on there. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Sorry okay. about that. Yeah, no problem. So yeah, ho hopefully you can pull that up and, Oh, actually let's see, started a screen share. So let's, Oh, there we go. Uh, let's see. Can I, Let's see. I definitely want to put that over onto. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I definitely want to put this on the other screen, but I guess I can share this real quick. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So this yeah. is <laughs> this is exactly what you were talking about. Um, uh, contradictory terms of use, and I and I I, I I pulled this example out. And I've not only I've sent this to the FTC. Mm -hmm. and uh, also the state AG's office to show that these terms of use are illegal. Not only uh, are they illegal according to the, the, the sheer size of uh, legalese that comes with it, um, um, make the terms of use illegal because nobody can read them or understand them, which is a violation of the consumer protection laws uh, regarding contracts. Um, and, and, and furthermore, they're, they're, they're contradictory um, and they tell you two things mm -hmm. as, as well. So, um, so the example I pulled up on the screen is, um, uh, and again, this goes back to when I, what, what I was talking about earlier, yeah. uh, that there, you're, 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 when you click on, I agree, you're accepting the online terms of use privacy policy and end user licensing agreements, but you're also uh, selecting what I call hidden terms of use which are the pre-installed application permission statements. These are the statements that come along with the app permissions. So the one I'm gonna show you as an example is Google. Google's privacy policy states this, we may share your non-personal identifiable information publicly with our partners, mm -hmm. like publishers, advertisers, developers, or right holders. So basically they're saying that you're, you're not identified when they share it to third party uh, third parties such as advertisers. However, if you pull up the Android application permission statement regarding your personal information, Google has this to say, allows apps to read your personal profile information stored on your device, such as your name and contact information. This means that apps can identify you and may send your profile information to others. Hmm. So I wrote Google and I said, which is it? You tell me on one hand, I'm not identified, but then you tell me because I use the apps in the, on the device that I am identified and it, that not only is the, the app developer who has this permission identify me, but they can take my information and send it to others. So it, it's a big lie. So this when, is an uh, example of what I was talking about with conflicting yep. end user license agreement within the same application or, or yeah within the same application or in use usage instance exactly so these app permissions are not just associated with the android os they're also associated with microsoft windows they're associated with apple um and, and they populate other devices supported by these operating systems such as a sony 4k tv which i brought up and a, and a blackberry device a lot of people think blackberry is secure they're not secure anymore um, uh, they're, they're supported by the, uh, Black BlackBerry supported by the Android OS. So if you think security is sharing your information with Google and their partners, uh, I got news for you. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that's, uh, and, and of course, like you said, BlackBerry is now, uh, running on Android and I'm glad that you mentioned windows in there because right. windows right. and especially with, uh, their, their edge browser is now running on Chromium. So I guess them too right. now. 
So yeah, now look at this with the Windows. If you don't do a custom install of your Windows 10 or Windows 8, uh, you're going to be bleeding all of your information to Microsoft, including key logging. They, they state in here that they will key log you. So everybody goes to quick install rather than custom install. If you custom install, you can turn a lot of this off. Uh, but people don't know that. They buy a computer, they pop it open. Even corporations buy computers, pop them open, and they don't go through the custom install to turn this stuff off. Well, they're key logging you. Mm -hmm. And they're saying they're doing it to make your browsing services better. But, you know, how does that make your browsing services well, better? Well, I can actually answer that one. So the, uh, the, the and, and we actually had Microsoft on to talk about this kind of thing. And they said that, you know, take for instance, you have the majority of, and of course everyone, um, you know, we know that you're mainly listening, but if you want to check out the video portion, we recommend you do that uh, after the show or during the show. Uh, but we do want to say that uh, Microsoft's response was like, Let's say someone wants to get to the, uh, wants to open up either a Word document or they want to open up a browser. They, you know, if they can turn uh, something, uh, a very common repetitive task that thousands or millions of people do every day, if they can turn that from three seconds to one second, if they can better position things, change the user interface to more optimize those routine tasks. It's kind of, you know, they're, they're setting it up for this is what people want to do. So we want to make sure our operating system is optimized to do what people want to do most. Uh, of course, yeah, key logging is not good. So, yeah. yeah. No, I, I go back to this. If you want to make your operating systems and browsers better, you can do that with uh, people in a laboratory environment and invite consumers in to work on But it's on the cheaper. Technology. And also, they can sell the information after they're done with it. Yeah, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but we... You know, we think that they're just packaging this information and just selling it to third parties for advertising dollars, but there, there could be other uses. Now, real quickly, I want to get into that a little bit because I want to talk about some of the cyber cybersecurity issues that I've, I've identified, which are highly important, Please do. along with this uh, data collection. So uh, getting back to the terms of use and why I think they're illegal, not only are they contradictory, but they are also hiding warnings from their, their users. This is an actual, what I have up on my screen and what you're looking at is a presentation that I do at trade shows such as IWCE 2020, which I'll be speaking at uh, coming up here um, in March. It's from uh, March 30th to April 3rd. And IWCE is a trade show centered on critical infrastructure, which is utility, public safety, and the defense industry. So I'll, I have a whole room full of people who work with, with, within a, a confidential and a protected environment, and I'll go into that in a minute. So getting back to this uh, app permission here, what you're seeing here is a Google Android app permission that actually warns the user to censor their speech because they are being monitored. Now this is tied to reading interaction and it's connected to hundreds of apps. And what, they, what Google tells you is that it'll allow the app to access and sync social updates from you and your friends. Be careful when sharing information. This allows the app to read communications between you and your friends on social networks, regardless of confidentiality. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if the cigarette industry uh, hid their product warnings on the inside of the packaging, they'd be sued by consumers right and left. Well, that's exactly what Google uh, is doing here and other app developers. They're hiding their, their product warnings within the within the product these th these app permissions should be published online with the use user end user licensing agreements but they know if people ever read these app permissions that they wouldn't buy the products in the first place now well, you said the it warnings are on there are multiple warnings it's not just warning you to answer your own speech but they're warning you that uh, 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 malicious pre-installed apps can uh, collect your uh, information. They hide that from you. They also uh, um, uh, talk about uh, uh, other product warnings as, as well. I identified over 15 product warnings that were hidden in the devices that should be published to the user. So, so. a couple of things here uh, that I can see. First thing is, uh, you know, for better or worse, I think a lot of people, or I should say companies, 
I, part of me feels like they assume, and trust me, uh, whenever people enter a business agreement and when you sign up for things like Facebook and Google and Android and buy a phone, uh, you are signing up for a business agreement, um, you should never assume. But I think people assume that when uh, they give permission to you know, track the location, use, you know, use the microphone, use the camera, things like that, uh, a lot of these warnings that you're finding, I think the companies assume people know or they assume that they don't know wow. and, hey, at least they're writing it so... You know, that, let, me add, yeah. let me read a couple of these product warnings to you. And, uh, let, let, uh, let me read a couple of these hidden application permissions and then ask you if you if you assume that this was going on. Sure. So uh, one the first one here is access your car speed. Did you know that uh, because they're collecting your uh, taking control of the accelerometer, they're monitoring your car speed? How's that going to make your browsing experience any better? <laughs> you know, and then um, here's the other one about your contacts. Allows the app to read data about your contacts stored on your phone, including frequency with which you called, emailed, or communicated in other ways with specific individuals. This permission allows apps to save your contact data and malicious apps can, may share your contact data without your knowledge. Uh, would you agree to that if you read that? Or that other one that tells you to censor your speech, would you agree to that? If you knew that, if it was on the product packaging, would you have bought the product? Yeah, that's uh, though those are like. Then, well, wait, let me wait, read you this yeah, one. Yeah, go for it. Let me read you this one. Allows the application to access your email attachment, and then the calendar one allows the app to read all calendar events stored on your phone, including those of friends and coworkers. This may allow the app to share or save your calendar data regardless of confidentiality or sensitivity. Now, in a consumer environment, you're struggling with this because. You're thinking about this within a consumer environment. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's making my consumerism better. I'm getting products through predictive analytics and suggestive technology. I'm being suggested what I like. It's making my experience better, yada, yada, yada. Now, let's go back to the uh, trade show that I speak at, IWCE. Now, ask yourself if you would agree to this if you're a public safety worker or you work in the defense industry and you're utilizing this technology and or you work for a hospital. Now, let me ask you if you feel comfortable using this when you're sitting in front of your doctor discussing your medical um, uh, uh, medical condition and or communicating with your doctor by text and or communicating to your doctor your, your calendar uh, events that tell you what your medical appointments are. Or you're sitting in front of your, your kid's school counselor and they're talking to you about uh, uh, maybe some um, uh, issues going on with your child and in, in, in and so forth. So you see where I'm going with this, as well as sitting in front of your child's doctors talking about your child's uh, uh, medical condition and so forth. So here's here's my response to all that, and, and and that's you know you're completely right. But as much as it probably should, none of these warnings, agreements, and user license, whatever, none of them have nuance. They're blankets. They are all encompassing. They're as you said before, you know, kind of legalese and legal protections for the company. Uh, there's zero nuance. It's just all permission to the tech companies. But see, people have been desensitized to clicking on I agree without reading it. And incrementally, these permissions have become more and more intrusive. When, when, when they started collecting information, it was simply collecting information from the use of their product or platforms. Now it's led into 24-hour surveillance, 24 well, hours a day. I, I, I would even, and, uh, you know, uh, Computer America was out at CES this year, and I'm sure that, you know, um, you've been to CES as well. Uh, I'm yes. sure. And, you know, back in 2016 was, I, I would say, kind of the first year that sensors and everything, it, it either became affordable enough or uh, these companies decided that, you know, we can do cool things with sensors. So uh, my go-to example was a ceiling fan company. They had air quality sensors, motion sensors, light sensors, and, you know, of course, clocks so they could, you know, set themselves on timers. And that was 2016. 2020, four, four years later, sensors are in everything. And, you know, to your point where these, uh, these uh, you know, the permissions have gotten more and more intrusive, it's because technology has moved to the age of sensors. It's very cheap, effective, and easy to track movement, right. voice, that kind of thing. I mean, yeah, they have to become more yeah, intrusive now, because technology is more intrusive. Well, it's not only sensors now. Now that's old, old game. Now it's voice automated assistants are yeah. being uh, manufactured into everything so that you're being forced to participate. People who don't want Amazon Alexa 
in their homes and don't want to buy an Echo device may find themselves buying an automobile and not and not having the choice, but uh, due to a partnership. Oh, with the I'll, I'll actually sure. one up you. Um, the Alexa the Alexa's going to be in their car, listening to their conversations in their car. I'll actually one up you. Uh, we recently bought a new fridge and the fridge was from Samsung. I yep. don't even like Bixby. I think Bixby is the worst of the digital assistants and I am in no way integrated with the Samsung ecosystem. You only get Bixby. There is no choice of the uh, of, of your digital overlord. It is Bixby or nothing for my fridge that is sitting in the middle of my house. So, uh, so this is what's happened to our technology. And I'll get off the permission, but I wanted to. People ask me all the time, can they turn your camera and microphone on without your permission? Yes, they do, and they tell you that. Now, this is the one that this is the hook where people said, I wouldn't have bought that if I knew that. Allows the app to record audio with the microphone. This permission allows the app to record audio at any time without your confirmation. The camera says the same thing. It can record video and audio without your confirmation. The last permission that I wanted to share with you, mm -hmm. most uh, uh, controversial permission of all, allows the app to disable the key lock in any associated password security. So <laughs> any of your locks that you put on there, Whatever permission, whatever app has this lock permission on there, gives that uh, man, that gives that app and platform the developer the ability to unlock your phone regardless of the password security that you put on there. So, now that yeah. so so what I wanted to what I wanted to go back to real quickly and why all this is becoming a cybersecurity threat um, is it goes back to uh, what I'm I'm bringing up. On this presentation here, so if you if you look at let me let me get to this if you if you look at these app permissions that are associated with with all these companies. So mm -hmm. let me pull up Facebook for example, and I'll show you um, Amazon. When you click on the Facebook app to access Facebook, you're agreeing to 62 total permissions that gives Facebook the ability to collect all of your, pretty much almost 100% of all sensitive user data off of your device, which is your, your contacts, email, plus your surveillance data, which includes your location data, uh, your motion data, and biometric data and other data. So that, that, that gives them the ability to collect that. Now, what people don't realize is that that data collection doesn't stop when you're not on the Facebook platform or using the Facebook app. That data collection is going on 24 by 7. Now, when you went on Facebook through your URL and not through the app, Facebook only had the ability to data mine you uh, when you were using their platform, uh, and that's fair. Where you use my platform, I'm going to collect information when you're on my platform. Now it's gone beyond that. Facebook doesn't care. Now, if I were to un if I were to unsubscribe to Facebook, mm -hmm. but did not disable the Facebook app on my phone, my tablet PC, my smart TV, Facebook will still have the ability to data mine me through the app because of the app permissions and not need me as a subscriber to collect my information. So it's the same thing with Alexa. Now you gotta ask yourself, why would the Alexa it's the same? amount of app permissions as, as Facebook, but you got to ask yourself, why does Amazon need to disable my, my, uh, uh, my passwords and locks? They have that ability. Facebook didn't have it, but the Alexa app does. Why did Google grant them that? Why, why did, or Apple, why, why does Amazon need to un circumvent my, my passwords for what? And again, it's the same thing. If I were to take the echo device, put it into a can, fill it with cement and drop it off in the uh, Gulf of Mexico, <laughs> and think that they can't collect information on me, they don't need that so to collect I'm, information on me because the Alexa app is still active and the Alexa app can still collect, control the microphone and the camera on my smartphone. So they don't even need the, the Amazon Echo or Dot to um, collect information, of, really to conduct audio and video surveillance on the user because they have control over your camera and mic anyways. Right. So they probably so, laugh about that. So two laugh. so 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 two responses to that. The first one, uh the, the disable key lock and passwords 
uh, it seems like that's a permission that again is written very poorly uh, in terms of you know the, the possible outcomes of what that means it seems like that's the way that they can push phone calls to your device and you know so that let's say you have a you have an incoming phone call uh, you don't have to push you know your uh, your your pin code uh, or yeah your pin code uh, to answer the phone every single time it, that is the reason that they would circumvent that they, they, they have a specific statement but then say it for other uses yes, as well yes so you gotta read it. so it, 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 they're very open-ended they're giving you a palatable example of how it's used but it's only an example of many ways it can be used now you know, if you're concerned about civil liberties, these companies partner with uh, the, the government. So, you know, and I would rather have the NSA surveil me than a private company that monetizes that information, surveil me, and then and open it up to multiple uh, state actors, such as the slide I just brought up. Now, this is what I talk about at uh, oh, these, Rex, uh, I, I have uh, enough- trade show. I have enough anxiety and contempt for all organizations that track me. I don't need to partition it out. So, but well, please go ahead. This, so, what I want to talk about a little bit about is the re rise of great power competition from Russia and China, plus other other bad actors. Sure. We saw this. We saw this pre World War II with uh, Italy, Japan, the Axis, um, yeah, and Germany. Um, and Russia, I mean, you know, back then they signed the original Axis Pacts. Uh, Russia was a part of that, along with uh, Germany, Japan, and Italy. <laughs> a lot of people don't go back that far in their history. Well, well, we saw what that led to. That led to whenever there's great power competition between countries over economic resources, that leads to war. When when losing factions are realize that the only way to win is by through warfare. Well, we're seeing that today. Um, with great power competition from Russia and China. And this isn't a figment of anybody's imagination. Um, uh, Secretary of State uh, Mike Pompeo addressed this at Zero Week 2019 last year in Houston, as well as uh, Chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff General Joseph F. Dunford uh, also addressed this uh, at the Atlantic Conference during the CNN interview. And so how is, how is that all related? Well, it's related to what's called asymmetrical hybrid warfare, which is something that we study at Black Ops Partners in Washington, D.C., uh, which really means that the, the modern battlefield is everywhere. So uh, that means that uh, uh, citizens are caught up in this, companies are caught up in this, and so forth. So how is that all related to app, app permissions and the collection of personal information from smartphones and computers? Well, if you look at uh, Google's, um, uh, Apple, and Microsoft's partners, there are nation state companies from China that include companies like ByteDance, which is TikTok, WeChat, which is Tencent, yeah. um, uh, and, and, and Badu, which. Uh, uh, so when you download these apps onto your phone, you're allowing these app developers to commandeer your sensor, your microphone, your camera, and collect all of that information. Um, now, this is a bigger cybersecurity threat to the U.S. than Huawei and ZTE combined. Um, and nobody's addressing this threat because what are apps again? Apps are legal malware. And now we're giving this access to nation state companies from Russia and China, as well as uh, uh, other bad actors. You know, the other one is Prisma. Prisma Photo Editor is one of the most popular editors in the world, and it's from Russia, mm -hmm. uh, a company from Russia. Now, for consumerism, no big deal. Everybody says they're not a threat. TikTok's not a threat to you. But when you utilize this information, these devices within a, a confidential and protected environment, such as the defense industry or, or uh, within critical infrastructure and utility, not only are you um, uh, giving up your corporate information to these companies, but you're also uh, uh, enabling these companies to monitor, track, and, and uh surveil people who work within uh, critical infrastructure, the government, and so forth. Now, the other issue is you brought up a, a, a point about, um, I think it was Mozilla having to pull um, 200, uh, yeah. uh, applications due to uh, security issues. Yes. Well, it's not only the fact that these apps can collect your personal and professional information. I'm, I'm going to go over one, one quick point here. Apps can also launch attacks on your network, uh, like DDoS attacks and, and uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. 
don't take my word for this. You're not going to see these well, news reports in the, in 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 from CBS or NBC because and these I do want to say, Rex, uh, uh, just real quick. Um, so first thing about the Mozilla, and honestly, we are like one minute from having to wrap up the show here. Yeah. So, yeah. um. You are, as I was going to say, before I say anything else, Rex, you're welcome back on Computer America whenever you want. You have a lot to say. No, I, I love, love what you're saying. Uh, so, so, but the thing I want to say about Firefox was that I think it was um, 121 of those apps that, or I should say add-ons that were deleted from the Firefox marketplace were deleted because they allowed third part, or they allowed um, scripts to be run from third party servers on the host machine. So anyone with access to that add-on could then launch attacks or run any kind of program that they wanted on the person who downloaded the add-on, which is strictly against their terms of service. So that's why they were pulled. Okay. Um, so uh, I, yeah, let's, uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to close it down with this, uh, this other screen up here. Uh, Google removes 300 Android apps that were launching DDoS attacks. The, there were even attacks on MDMs, uh, on Apple's MDM platform which allowed corporate data to be leaked to Chinese companies through Apple apps, security apps. I believe it. Uh, remember I told you that the MDM apps don't, don't trust the security on these things? I, Android apps are also, are, and uh, Apple apps are so... Uh, Rex, uh, I, I unfortunately have to uh, shut you down right there because it's been yeah. an hour, and the hour has flown on by. Ladies and gentlemen, if you want to find out more, this particular PowerPoint seems to be his, uh, you know, what he gives to a bigger listening audience, but I would say check it out, mysmartprivacy.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. Rex, uh, I'll give you the last word. Uh, if people want to find out more, where can they go? Uh, my website, www.mysmartprivacy.com, and, and you can read the articles that I've written for uh, numerous publications uh, around the world. Uh, most mainly, I've, I've written uh, for the Epic Times. I have an author page at the Epic Times if you want to look that up, and that's spelled E P O C H Times, Epic Times, as well as I write for uh, Mission Critical Communications uh, uh, magazine. Um, as well, which is a magazine centered on the uh, uh, critical infrastructure and uh, the defense industry. Um, uh, it's mostly read by uh, industry insiders within those industries All as right. well. Perfect. And hey, uh, you know, feel free to send that over, but uh, we're going to include it in the show notes. And everyone, once again, uh, I want to thank Rex for coming on the show and thank you for tuning in to Computer America. Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.